Welcome to the very first episode of our P2G podcast. We are thrilled to have you join us on this exciting journey as we delve into a wide range of fascinating topics related to Judaism, including its rich history, culture, traditions and contemporary issues. Our goal is to provide a platform for insightful conversations and diverse perspectives that will inspire and educate our listeners in Israel and in the US as well. We hope you will find our discussions informative, entertaining and thought-provoking. Over the coming episodes, we'll be exploring a diverse, a diverse range of subjects. Our guests will be experts in their fields, uh, each bringing a unique perspective and insight that hopefully will leave you with a deeper understanding of the world around us. We're excited to share our passion for learning and exploration with you and hope you will join us as we embark on this journey together. So sit back, relax, and let's get started. So, questions. Um, uh, first of all, we would like to introduce our very special guest, Diana Groh, who is an uh, amazing uh, uh, creator of this documentary, Regina. And today we are going to discuss uh, this documentary, with questions and answers. Uh, we have volunteers from the Young Adult uh, Forum here in Budapest, uh, who have really nice questions, so it's your turn. Hello everyone, I'm, I'm, I thank you for having me and inviting me, so I'm ready to all kind of questions. First, can you talk a little bit about your upbringing, how you um, became interested in uh, directing about your Jewish identity? Ah, so you want me to go back to the last century, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> well actually Judaism is the part of my life originally. Uh, I'm coming from a Jewish family. My grandmother who is still alive. She's a Holocaust survivor and actually I belong to the third generation who, who uh, which somehow tried or managed to break the long silence that was actually usual after, uh, after 45. Uh, I was born in the 70s so actually I my life is really influenced, you know, by the Holocaust stories and so on, and uh, also the somehow that kind of exercise and method how we try to bring back the stories before the Shoah at Holocaust and asking questions to our survivor grandparents about the past, uh, not only about what happened in the concentration camp, but how it happened, I mean the deportation, how it happened here in Hungary uh, before the Germans uh, arrived. Uh, what, what was the other question? What did you have another question? Um, first of all, I would like to know when did you uh, learn about Regina, Regina's character? How did you find out that uh, she existed? Okay, uh, so I, then I just Jump back to the previous question. I was always focus on, uh, focusing on a Jewish topic uh, in my works. It, it's, uh, it's not was, it was not because I really wanted. It was somehow, uh, it came somehow instinct, from instinct, instinctly. Uh, and uh, I could find always uh, very, very important issues uh, when I really didn't want to say, I couldn't say no because I felt it's important. So this is, that's how I, I, I met Regina Jonas' uh, stories. She was the first female rabbi uh, in the world. Uh, she perished in Auschwitz and she, was ori uh, she originally was born in Berlin. Um, and uh, in 2000, four or five, I don't remember. Uh, I just finished my first long feature film. The title was A Miracle in Krakow. It was a debut film of mine. And I was telling you know about my Jewish roots and so on. And it was screened at the Amsterdam Jewish Film Festival mm -hmm. where uh, a woman rabbi was invited and opened the, opened the festival. And when she saw my film, the, this debut film, Miracle in Krakow, she asked me if I wanted to, if I would be interested in to make, uh, to make a film uh, about the first female rabbi of the world. And I said, no, 
I'm fed up with Jewish topic in all my <laughs> life, really. Until that I may, made some documentaries also about my generations, mm -hmm. about Chagall. So it, it was, a, I really wanted some light topic, okay? When, when you want to breathe. And she, I said, no, I'm not interested. Please mm -hmm. give me some, I'm very sorry. And she recommended her book, actually, to read. And um, as far as I remember, she even gave me a kind of uh, a present. She she made a bio, she wrote a biography about Regina Jonas, and um, years later I read this book, mm -hmm. and I was really amazed. And it was not because Regina Jonas was the first female rabbi. It's I mean the female rabbi. I mean I it's a, it was not the point that she was the first and mm -hmm. female. The point was that she was such a amazing. Uh, an ordinary person who, who I thought uh, would deserve a film because she was that kind of uh, leader, religious leader, mm -hmm. or she became a leader who saved life, lives, you know. Yes. So yeah, this is how it started. So two years later, I said, okay, I want to make a film, a documentary film. No, first I wanted to make a fiction film, but then I decided to make a documentary because I really wanted to tell the truth. But I chose a big challenge because I really knew that I don't want to make series of interview with the women rabbis mm -hmm. because it was not about them. Uh, so though I didn't want to bring the present with talking heads and so on. I really wanted to focus on on this extraordinary person, Regina Jonas, about whom only one single photograph survived. So that's why I decided to base my film on one single photograph, and that's why it took seven years journey to finish this archive movie. It's interesting that you said it was not so uh, important that the first and she, but after I watched this documentary, for me it seems she is an amazing feminist icon of the 20th century as well. You know, I would be really... Uh, I think people... This is a kind of uh, lever they use, uh, people use for her. I am absolutely not against the reform uh, movement and so on, but I really do believe a rabbi is not uh, becoming, uh, is not a good rabbi because of any kind of documents or because of the, uh, uh, if it's female or male. Mm. If you are, if you are born to be, become a good and a true rabbi, priest, or whatever, then uh, your community will prove your, uh, your worth, you know, the, the feedback of your uh, community give, give the feedback about uh, the person who is a rabbi. And uh, actually, uh, from the point of view of Regina Jonas, it was really interesting, she was an orthodox, uh, rabbi, and she really did not care about uh, uh, about being the first female rabbi that will come, I will show you, and so on. It was the reaction and the feedback of the community who, who which were really amazed by her practice, by her, you know, openness, by her deep uh, teachings and so on. So uh, I really do not want to qualify rabbis, males and females in the world. They do whatever they want or what uh, it's the best when they do what they feel this is their call. But uh, you know, there are bad rabbis, I mean, and males and females and good, good ones. So this is why I just mentioned that I was really impressed by her personality. Mm -hmm. The way she was, she, she was not, uh, it was a long journey uh, when she got uh, finally a kind of certification about her ordination. But during, uh, during this long process, she was really practicing as a true rabbi should uh, work. 
and uh, her relation with uh, people, helping people, not only, not only let's say pure Jewish uh, mm -hmm. families, but uh, uh, mixed families where one of the parents are uh, were Jewish in these hard times, uh, in the 30s, 40s of the Holocaust. I think it was really extraordinary. So back to your question, I was really impressed by her life story, what I could build uh, up from the feedback of, uh, of her community. And uh, did you uh, make like um, um, extra research uh, on Regina or, or did you base uh, the film on the um, biography you received? Uh, no, I immediately I went to Berlin, to Centrum Judaicum, where I could find her paper and personal documents, mm -hmm. uh, which miraculously survived the Shoah. You know, everything generally was burnt and so on, but somehow uh, the Jewish community, uh, um, where she uh, deposit, deposited, yes, her documents before her uh, deportation, in 43, uh, from Berlin first to Theresienstadt, she, she decided to collect all her documents and, and uh, take it to the Jewish community. I think she somehow hoped that maybe when she would return, she would find all these documents that, uh, that were thousands or hundreds of letters written uh, to her from, from the people, from her uh, community and also this package of documentation included her certification, I mean the, about the ordination mm -hmm. of uh, Rabbi certificate and one single photograph which was made in 35. So she left all these documents there, she never returned but these documents miraculously survived. And uh, I started to read the letters addressed and written to her. And that's why I decided to somehow structure my documentary film, the screenplay, based in chronology uh, on, on these personal letters, which were written by her friends, people from community, mm -hmm. from, uh, by other rabbis, uh, which included some articles that uh, that she published, or not she published, she wrote for Jewish uh, uh, newspapers. And from these little mosaics, I could pair as a screenplay uh, the, the, the basic line of, of the text of the, uh, of the film, because as for the visual part, I had a big challenge. I had one single photograph, so I really started to make a deep research in different uh, photo archives in Berlin, in Jerusalem, in, in the States, in, in the Washington Holocaust Museum, in Yad Vashem, in the Sam Spiegel, not Sam Spiegel, uh, sorry, the Stefan uh, uh, Spielberg archives. I was looking for footages which were shot by by unknown people, so amateur, non-professional footages from the about Berlin and about the neighborhoods and about the situations where she, uh, in which she could be, or she was supposed to be, or I witnessed, or or witnessed, mm -hmm. and this is how I try to build the documentary that. From her point of view, although there is only one photograph, I wanted her to to put her somehow to to feel the audience that she is also on the screen uh, when we are watching these archive footages, walking uh, on the streets of Berlin, mm -hmm. sitting on the U-Bahn, uh, I don't know, going to synagogues. Uh, so this is that was a challenge. Okay. I have a, well, not a question, but question-ish. Um, <laughs> so, in the movie, uh, we saw that when the Holocaust came and the rabbis were deported from Berlin, she um, 
this movement has opened a way for her to get the stage to in in order to become like famous or get a not famous but to 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 get known uh, within the communities and do you think if there wasn't the holocaust this would have happened like um, if she if she w would she be would recognized as the first female yes. rabbi listen yes. i think yes because uh, although it's not so much detailed in this film, but uh, she had the choice to to also to leave Germany, yeah. and she stayed. She stayed with those people who really needed her. Uh, the other reason, yes, this is a kind of fact that there were fewer fewer rabbis yes. uh, left in Germany. Uh, some of them were deported, were already deported earlier, or some of them left. You have to know that after 38, um, because we are talking about in the 30s, yeah, uh, Hitler came to the power in 33, the Nuremberg laws in 35, yes. uh, the war just start, uh, let's say, in 39, but the first concentration camp, Dachau, is already, uh, uh, is existed already in 33. And after 38 Jews really couldn't leave Germany. So those who stuck in, within Germany, it was obvious that uh, they would be sent to different concentration camps. So back to your question, her decision was to stay. And uh, I think she, you know, she was not working, she didn't work because she wanted to become this kind of uh, title, title yeah. but uh, she she stayed because she had a community where, where where people many people had no other choices but you know stay and waiting for the end. Although they couldn't, I think, also imagine what is the real end. But many of uh, uh, actually, from the documentary, it turned out that because of these very special circumstances, many rabbis left Germany. Uh, there was a really huge and increasing need of uh, having rabbis for small communities. So maybe these special circumstances had to had her to be a rabbi a little bit earlier. So without these circumstances, maybe. Uh, she would have been a rabbi, but a little bit, a little bit later, maybe. And I, I tell you something, that uh, she was actually discovered much, much later. I mean, that uh, she worked as the first female rabbi. So, in '44, she, she, perished, she perished in Auschwitz, mm -hmm. and uh, there was a long, long silence. Nobody talked about her, even uh, not really Viktor Frank. If you know this name, he, is, he was a fantastic uh, uh, psychologi uh, psychologist and who wrote uh, that, you, I don't know in English, uh, uh, his book that uh, how to say yes to life, in how to survive. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a basic book and he worked together with uh, Regina Jonas in Theresia uh, uh, they were focusing on how to keep people mm -hmm. alive and how to, you know, give some strength uh, to think about the future. Mm -hmm. Because thinking, of, thinking about the future is a kind of motivation that gives you kind of uh, strength to survive. Uh, and it actually, this is the basic, uh, fundamental think in the Judaism, you know, that you have to tell your story, you have to survive to tell your story, and uh, that there are, there are some goals in, in life. And Victor Frank also did not or has not mentioned so much uh, Regina Jonas' names later, and it was uh, actually a researcher uh, from the States uh, Whose name Katarina Kallenbach, who discovered uh, uh, who discovered Regina Jonas' documents in, in in Berlin, and after her discovering, I mean, including these letters and uh, and the documents, uh, other female rabbis and other researchers and more and more people discovered that wow. 
once upon a time, uh, there was a female rabbi, and actually the first one who was ordained in uh, Berlin, named Ragina Jonas. And yeah. uh, like, do we know whether um, her becoming as a first rab a woman rabbi had a direct effect on other, other con in other countries, like uh, the possibilities for women? Absolutely. I think that already in the States it, it already existed. Uh, I'm not so, so much expert in, you know, religious thing. I mean, I'm, I'm Jewish, I have a bad Jew, uh, so I sometimes I keep Shabbat or sometimes not, I think. And so it's, and so my Jewish identity, it's, it's, it's a different, it's very strong. But it's, you know, what I know that uh, Leo Beck Institute exists in, uh, in, in London and also in the States where, uh, where women are uh, welcomed uh, to study as a rabbi and they can ordain, ordain uh, as a rabbi. Uh, also, you, it's really interesting that the first, the very first, uh, let's say, Central, Central European rabbi is from Hungary, if you know Kati Kelemen, uh, Katalin Kelemen, the head of the Sim Shalom uh, community. She also finished uh, her studies in, in, at Leubeck Institute, I think, I am, I am, I am right. But as far as I know, she went to study to London. And uh, these Leo Beck institutes were really uh, focusing on, on, on studies, on female rabbi studies. Um, you mentioned that, that uh, this thing that she was, she was a woman, that wasn't your focus. And uh, it's it's very similar to what, what uh, you cite from her, that she said something like this, that, that uh, if you're given kind of talent, then you have to use it. It doesn't matter if you're yeah, a, man. a man or a woman. Um, but my question is that at the end of, of the film, uh, we jump, jump as, as, uh, to, to nowadays, saying that it is still not, not uh, widely uh, acknowledged for women being, being rabbis. So why, why was it still important for you to... We to just, come to this conclusion? You know, actually, I tell you, I don't know if it's important or not, but it's a kind of fact. I mean, this is why that... I think every, everyone should do what uh, she or he feels, uh, you know, like a call, like a, that uh, people could make with devotion, and I really think that uh, this kind of freedom is really important. Uh, although it might opposite some old uh, laws and uh, yeah expectations, but I think uh, yeah I I really I really believe in equality. Maybe that's why it was important this information. Yeah, and and, and you said said this uh, that that she was an extraordinary person. That was more important for you than being a woman or a or a man, and uh, and somehow it's it's always like uh, if you are breaking old habits, then you know for a man it was you know if you were a kind of okay uh, quality, then you could be a rabbi, it's fine. But for a woman, being just okay couldn't have been enough. So for being being a rabbi, you should have been uh, an extraordinary, and it was the same with I don't know black people in in the states and so on. That that, that the first few has had to be really really extraordinary. To extraordinary, be but you know I always think that maybe you can be the first, but maybe a level as a first, but maybe as a human you are not so great. But in her case, she was really ex an extraordinary person. And the other thing, the feedbacks, you know, her life was told in this movie through the, through the records, the commemorations and through the letters. So actually people who knew her just described her real uh, personality on the screen. And people were really happy and amazed by, by her strengths and by her, yeah, uh, extraordinary character. And I, I think 
This is also something very important message for all, I think, Jew, Jewish people should, have, should know about her, because if she was not Jewish, probably she should have a kind of tree at uh, Yad Vashem. Mm -hmm. But knowing about her, I think it's a basic thing uh, for all Jewish people and also not Jewish people. So, so this documentary was the first uh, that made her story visible. Uh, what was the reception of this documentary? I mean, uh, uh, in Jewish circles, in Panini circles, or in general, so uh, has she got any, uh, I mean, public uh, uh, street name uh, after her or any memorial created? Absolutely, and it's still incredible. It's incredible that uh, this journey has not ended uh, with the film because uh, I I started this film in, maybe in 2000 I don't know six seven I, the Hungarian premiere was in 2013 made a German version uh, and an English version so actually all work finished at two, around 2015 16 uh, I tell you the biggest there were two uh, main award for me personally. One was a kind of festival award that the Jer Jerusalem Film Festival uh, awarded it as the best festival films that got the Laia Award, uh, the award of the festival. And it was amazing, not because of the, the prize, you know, but also when if you ever visited Jerusalem, the Jerusalem Film Festival is very close to the Kota, to the Western or to the Old City. And all those, and since my, my film is based on, only on archive footages, where you can see the faces of the people, of those who maybe you don't know if they managed to survive or not. But somehow, through this through the festival, through the film, the, the language of motion picture, and the screening, uh, their faces appeared in Jerusalem. I am not religious, but you know, when we say that, uh, see you next year in Jerusalem, you know, I think it was a kind of, you know, a fantastic feeling that uh, I don't know who could survive from those footages, how many of them managed, but uh, they are there. They were there in Jerusalem. Uh, so this screening and this award was one of the most important recognition. Also, uh, as for the Hungarian part, actually the Hungarian state did not uh, support this film, as many of my others, they do not uh, participate, but this is another topic. Uh, the we had a Hungarian uh, screening and uh, also Gabor Ivani, the, you know, the head of the Evangelical Church. Yes, Church, after watching the film at the premiere, uh, he invited me to his community to screen the film and he made a kind of ordination, a tab tablet, how do you say, in his uh, in his yard, college yard, they also invited uh, Kati Kellerman, uh, and they both uh, said a Kaddish for Regina Jonas. So this was also kind of, I think, maybe the most important moment as the recognition and the long life of the memory of Regina Jonas, when a Christian peace and a woman rabbi saying a Kaddish, uh, because it just how justified the, you, that uh, Regina Jonas was a kind of uni universe, a person universal. And she had a... The other beautiful moments were that uh, this, uh, this film was uh, screened at the BBC4 on the Holocaust uh, Memorial. A days was screened at the Yad Vashem, at the UNESCO Palace, at the Library of Congress. So many 
uh, many important pieces and hundreds of festivals. And last year, uh, I, I got a call from Berlin that uh, they are working uh, to, to name a street after Regina Jonas in Berlin. So the process is on. Again, this June we go again. Uh, I go back to Berlin and uh, I will get more news about this, but the process has started. So actually, unbelievable, but uh, the film is still invited many, many places and yeah. And we are also here talking about And it. it's <laughs> also unbelievable that, yeah, it's, it's mm -hmm. fantastic. And it's on Netflix. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's on the uh, Netflix UK, he has mm -hmm. released uh, the, the film. And how did Rachel Weisz get into the picture? Oh, yes, it's <laughs> really Burning important. Me. <laughs> yes, it's really important. Uh, and actually it's uh, the most important thing that uh, when the Hungarian state rejected to, the institution rejected to, to, to uh, support me, I, I started to uh, make my researches uh, applying for different institutions. Uh, abroad, Jewish, not Jewish, and so on. So the researches, uh, the researches uh, took a lot of time. But it, one, it is one thing. The other thing is that you have to, you know, pay for this archive footage. It's very ex expensive. And Rachel's uh, father, who, whose name is uh, George Weiss, he unfortunately passed away a few years ago. Uh, a friend of very good. Uh, was a friend of a friend of a good friend of mine, mm -hmm. and actually, when I had a, in two thousand eight, I had a, still a Jewish topic. I had a, a premiere in in Spinoza uh, Theater here, uh, with the title the place title was Address Unknown. Uh, this friend asked me to bring George, so Rachel's father, also to the mm -hmm. premiere. And we started to talk and he asked, uh, he liked very much the play and he asked me what I am, what I am working on, was wo working at that moment. And I shared my experience with that and my story that I am, I am, I am making a, a very long researches and actually I am looking for I really, I am in the process of mm -hmm. fundraising, and he was very, very interested in in the story of Regina Jonas. I think he also uh, appreciated, I think, very much uh, mm -hmm. the personality of Regina Jonas, and through his foundation, he his, he he decided to support us, which was a huge thing yes. because without Rachel's father. Uh, George Weiss, this, this film couldn't exist. And what is also really interesting, and I will be back to Rachel, that George Weiss was born in Hungary, and he was, I don't know, something eight or nine years old, uh, when he left mm -hmm. Hungary, after the first, or first uh, anti-Jewish law. You know, that was the... 38, 39, and 41 anti-Jewish laws, and his family left in time. So when we were ready the, with the Hungarian version, we decided to make an English version, and I was actually, it was an, it was an idea that maybe, uh, it was the idea of George, he really wanted that Rachel, mm -hmm. Give uh, yes, gives uh, her voice, and, uh, I, I could. I was all the time over the moon, moon, uh, moon uh, hearing this, but you know, Rachel was a very, very busy and uh, you know, super, um, super active and super famous uh, person. So actually, I, I couldn't really believe that uh, we, mm -hmm. we could succeed. And uh, and uh, when we were actually. Uh, were ready with the English voiceover with everyone. I could. I when I, I decided not to wait uh, to, more mm -hmm. or waste time. 
rating. It was really important, the English uh, release. Finally, Rachel said yes, so we, we recorded with her voice. It was amazing, through Skype. Uh, <laughs> she was in, uh, you know, we connected two studios, one from Hungary, from Budapest, the other wow. was in New York. Mm. We communicated through Skype, uh, Skype and she was really amazing. Yeah, so this is the story. And I think, uh, or as far I know, and I know that she really liked the movie. Um, so I, I was just wondering that do you think that uh, women in Judaism should take, or women rabbis in Judaism should take the same approach as, as she did? So as Regina, that she was rather devoted to the communities and the people and rather than like, focusing on them, rather than advancement itself. So do you think that that's also the way forward today for um, women having bigger roles in Judaism? Having big heroes? Or, or, no, no, I mean, like, women advancing within Judaism, do you think that they should be taking kind of the same approach as she did? You know, I think it's, uh, it depends on what the, also the historical time and the circumstances. Because in peace, you can be a good priest, rabbi, whatever, and there is no danger. When we live in a time when you are life in danger, then all kind of religious uh, leaders, uh, let's say, have the opportunity, or it's a, it is the real time when they have they have to show or they can show what they can do for for their peoples. So I think it's not about expectation what we expect from from our leaders. I think it's. It's always the time we are in living, uh, which counts that uh, how, how, uh, how a rabbi, let it be a man or a woman, uh, or how a community can count, can count on, on, on their leader, religious leader. Is it? Yeah. Is it okay? <laughs> Um, we have a question here. Um, could you find uh, people who knew her personally? Um, you told, you told us that uh, the documentary based on the archives and letters, and but did you find people who are still alive? And unfortunately, when I started to to uh, work on this documentary, none of their students or friends uh, or survivors uh, were alive, so they all passed. But what was really interesting that uh, the woman, the, the writer and at the same time a rabbi uh, from Germany, Elisa Kropet, who wrote the biography, mm -hmm. uh, she, she wrote uh, her book, uh, I don't know, in the 80s, and she had the chance to make interviews uh, with uh, uh, with survivors, some of her students. So I, these recordings, uh, I, I couldn't get these recordings because unfortunately she lost the recordings and so on, but the text of the interviews remained and she passed me over the, the text. So I started to reconstruct, I mean, I was inviting non-professionals and maybe Holocaust survivors who uh, gave their voices of the other sur sur Holocaust survivors who were already passed. Is it, mm -hmm. is, it, uh, mm -hmm. is it clear? And among them, for example, this is how my grandmother, I invited my grandmother to this production the free version in Hungarian, German and English because she can speak uh, this, all these uh, languages. That time she was, I don't know, 87, 6, or I don't know, 88. And um, since I, I really needed voiceovers uh, from Holocaust survivors, uh, and my idea, my basic idea was that I don't want to use any actors okay. who 
records or read the text uh, about the Holocaust, about the concentration camps, because in a documentary, then anyway, it's really important. Your voice tells everything, and it's not about acting, or even it's not uh, about uh, sympathizing or uh, feeling empathy. It's mm -hmm. one thing. But uh, since my grandmother is a Holocaust survivor, she really knew and knows what, for example, four concentration camp at the death mass me means or meant. I invited her and two other uh, friends of her to participate at this film because they really knew what they were talking about. Mm -hmm because they eyewitnessed and they felt. So in their voice, I mean their voice, the voice cannot never lie, you know? So mm -hmm. that's why I, I, this is how I put the testimonies of those who, mm -hmm. who were not alive during my, my uh, the process of my filmmaking. So you gave an authentic, authenticity uh, to this whole, um the voices give authenticity to the to the pictures and so on. Absolutely, and you know, it's uh, I just the, I remember the way I I asked my grandma and her friends that I told them that listen, you never knew known Regina Jonas, but this uh, this uh, interviews the text of the mm -hmm. interviews tell the story of the other uh, survivors. On the same times, these interviews also about the concentration camps. You really know, you really know what mm -hmm. cards uh, look like. You you really remember your experiences. And on the other hand, if it's a kind of creative life from the point of the filmmaker, that regarding my the age of my grandmother and my grandmother's friends, I told them that listen, you never know uh, Regina Jonas, but you were you were born in that. Mm -hmm. uh, time that if you were born in in Berlin, you could have been her students. So this is this is another uh, yeah uh, it was another an artistic approach. Um, so you had all these archival footages and letters and um, all of these things. So how did you come up with constructing the storyline? So what was your approach in you know making the film from beginning to end? Uh, I wanted to keep a kind of chronology, from the birth until the death. We, we are talking about a very short life, but a very intense one. Uh, I really wanted to show the place, Berlin, where she was born. And I really uh, wanted to show the communities and uh, her activities and, you know, the everyday life also that she could be part of, for example walking on the streets of Berlin, uh, as I told you, at the, maybe I already mentioned, or reading a newspaper, or writing a letter, or, you know, just, uh, just uh, celebrating uh, um, a, sh a Shabbat. I, I think it was really uh, hard because uh, in order to show her on the screen, although she's not there, it was a challenge how I can, how can I solve this problem? Uh, and I, I chose the method that I will use different women's character of different archive footage. And it doesn't matter if, she, uh, if they are similar or not. I mean, it not, does not matter that that she's not that person, but who knows? Maybe also sh she was passing in the in the crowd on on that day, on that morning. Maybe she was the one who was dancing in the in the far with the uh, with uh, uh, with the man of her life, you know. So it it was a creative. It's a, it was a creative process, and actually, I felt. Maybe this makes this movie more universal, open, mm -hmm. uh, open your mind that, uh, that uh, one story, so the, the history co consists 
from different lives mm -hmm. uh, mosaics. I have one another one other question. So uh, the love letters. Uh, so we get to know in the end of the movie that end of the movie that uh, she has a late love, uh, a much older uh, man, and. Uh, were the love letters in the archive uh, you discovered in Berlin, or how did these come, and how was it? How did it feel uh, to read those letters? Because they are, must have been intimate letters. It or... was. It was super interesting, and uh, I was super lucky because actually these uh, letters were not in the archives, but. Uh, I really do not remember. Somehow I got the contacts of the children of, uh, of uh, Rabbi Norden, who was the late uh, mm -hmm. love of Redina uh, Jonas, who survived uh, the Holocaust and who left Germany uh, before, uh, before uh, 38. And, uh, I think they were, yes, of course, they were from a different marriage, a previous mm -hmm. marriage of, of uh, Rabbi Norden. And somehow I managed to contact, uh, to contact uh, the grandchildren and they sent me over these letters. And uh, I was really amazed, really. I was very impressed and so mm -hmm. on. And I asked their permission to put, to include uh, into the movie. and. Uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I think it's it's a really important part of the movie because uh, it's the part of it's the, you know it's the absurd moment in the la uh, in, in 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 this crazy historical period that everything is very bad, but you can be a little happiness. Actually, you can find a happiness. Uh, so it's a beautiful story. Of course, not the end, but uh, so it miraculously I, I I could get in contact with two grandchildren. And actually, they watched the film at the San Francisco Jewish Film Festival, and they immediately wrote me so that they were happy and okay. It's wonderful. Well, what are the odds? You never know what you find. So it was a really meaningful and inspiring conversation. Thank you, especially uh, Diana Gro, the creator of the documentary Regina. And you listen to our volunteers from Budapest, Young Adult uh, Platform, uh, Nori, Lotzi, Peter and Emesha. I was Istvan. Thank you, uh, Shara, our coordinator in Budapest. And thanks for the technical support, uh, Peter. Uh, our pilot podcast has got a very important mission as well. Uh, it's a call for our friends in Israel and in the United States to join us and create your own podcast uh, to reflect to our topics and to share it. Thank you very much and uh, goodbye. Lahit Raut, Vislat. Shalom. Shabbat shalom.